everyone, this is David Stark from WatcherPass.com, your website for movie reviews, interviews, and recommendations. Today, I'm joined by Ben Sharrock, the writer and director of Limbo, which is releasing April 30th, 2021 in theaters. We're going to talk to Ben in just a second, but first, let's check out the trailer. And while you're watching, if you can like and subscribe to this channel, that would be fantastic. It helps me out a lot. Thank you. I want to introduce our new flatmate. <laughs> a funny thing happened to Omar on his way to freedom. Hey! You one of their refugees? Yes. Fate took a detour. What's your name, pal? Omar. Right, Omar. Don't pull up shite or like rape anyone, right? Okay. One wrong step and they would deport us. You ever think about who you were before all of this? In Syria, very famous. Maybe a little. Maybe I could be your agent. Like Tom Cruise of Jerry Maguire. <laughs> You can be whatever you want as long as you work hard enough. Hey, Paul, want a leaflet? Thank you. That's not ping pong for a hat. Yes, ping pong, ping pong. Hello. Perfect. Hi, David. Hey, Ben, how are you? Hey, good, good, how are you? Can you, can you tell how I'm feeling? Just from the eyes? <laughs> Happy. There we go. Yay. <laughs> I, am, I am excited to talk about this film. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the film is, is Limbo. It's, it's about people kind of, you know, waiting and being stuck in this, this situation where they really have no control over whether they stay or go. Um, it, it's coming out right maybe on the tail end of a situation where basically the world has no control on uh, whether they can come and go. So uh, the first question is, was this written pre or post COVID? I'm assuming pre COVID. And then this is just a, a, a sad, strange coincidence that's coming out right now after we've all been stuck inside for a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, this was written. Yeah. Quite, quite significantly pre COVID. Excellent. And then, um, so I guess, what was the inspiration for this film? Was it your own studies, things that, that it's on the news? Or did you, I don't know, did you visit a, a migrant uh, camp at some point? Yeah, so it, it's something that goes back like, you know, quite a long time, uh, 10 plus years. And, you know, I think it really starts uh, at the point that I was living in, in Syria during my um, studies. Um, and this was just a year before uh, the civil war started. Um, and then I kind of, I guess sort of flash forward to when I was decided that I wanted to be a filmmaker and I was at film school and I ended up going out to the Sahrawi refugee camps in southern Algeria and working with an NGO there um, and that the project of the NGO was quite specifically about identity and how the label of being a refugee affects identity and then kind of flash forward again um, to when the refugee crisis became very prevalent in the media I was kind of, I was really struck by the representation of refugees and how on the one side we had the demonizing of refugees and on the other we had the pitying of refugees. And both of these things were really, you know, dehumanizing. Um, and I felt like there was this kind of gap in the middle where we weren't looking at refugees like human beings, um, like us that we could relate to. Um, so I kind of set off on, on uh, this journey to, to write a film about the broad subject of the ref refugee crisis um, and, you know, really try to, you know, had to figure out how to approach this subject matter um, with, you know, my sensibilities as a filmmaker. Um, and part of that was, you know, with the desire to use humor. Um, and part of that was kind of having this list of things to avoid when, when approaching this subject. That's a really interesting point because I, I actually hadn't thought about that. You know, you, you're right though. You kind of, you know, demonize refugees for, you know, taking over the country, or whatever you want to, you know, whatever that view is. And then you also pity them when you see these terrible stories come out. But you don't really get much of a sense of, you know, them as people, as, as just kind of you know, your neighbors, your, you know, potential future coworkers and bosses. And, and this is, that's a very interesting angle to take this. And I'm, I'm glad you did because this film, I think, accomplishes that greatly. Oh, thank you. 
Um, and you mentioned your studies. You know, you took the very traditional film school route of going and studying Arabic and politics, which I think all film students probably study, and then going to uh, go, going to get your film degree. So I guess what was what was that pivot? Had you always been interested in film, or did you just see film as a vehicle to kind of pursue your your your, your previous studies, but kind of reach more people than maybe the traditional kind of uh, career route? Yeah, no, it was something that I, you know, it, it's it's a weird one because it was only kind of in hindsight that I started to kind of realize how maybe I arrived at this point of being a, a filmmaker and following that route. And, you know, I grew up um, being involved in a lot of theater and youth theater. And I actually kind of, from a young age, you know, I wanted to be an actor. Um, I think I, you know, grew up really, you know, to, to to about the age of 18, um, convinced that I, that I was going to be an actor, that that's what I was going to do. Um, and then <clears throat> I think I just sort of bailed on it because I felt like maybe I wasn't really good enough or I don't know, I didn't have the, the, the confidence. And so then thought I'd go and get a sort of, you know, a, a safe kind of sensible degree. And that's how I ended up going into studying Arabic and politics. Um, and then uh, yeah, in my final year of that degree, I came back from Syria and uh, I started to specialize in Middle Eastern cinema. And that's really kind of what changed everything for me. And I was studying a lot of Iranian cinema and um, I came across two films as well, two Arabic films in quite quick succession. Well, one um, film called uh, The Time That Remains by Elias Suleiman. Uh, Palestinian uh, director and another film uh, called The Band's Visit by Aaron Colleran. Um, uh, and um, I, uh, yeah, and, I, and, and it was that moment actually watching those two films that I was like, I want to be a film director. And it just sort of changed my understanding of what cinema could be. Um, and then, yeah, basically I, after that, you know, I, I, I went, yeah, I think everyone was sort of looking at grad jobs and things and kind of going to work in banks and things <laughs> like that. And I was like, I'm going, I'm going to go to film school and, and try my luck there. That's the, the standard career path. That, that's, that's awesome though, really, you know, and this, this is only your second film, right? So like, how are you so good? Like this film is, is fantastic. Like how did you, <laughs> how did, like, I, I guess you know what, how how did you kind of get this film into your head and, and get these all these little details that I think were so noticeable and, and that make it such a unique movie? Oh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I I think it was I don't I was very I, in a way I'm kind of very fortunate because you know this is my first funded feature film and it's my first kind of industry feature film and you know before this I you know I made you know, a, a really low budget, um, self-funded feature outside of the industry. And I think that that having the kind of opportunity to do that was just such a, uh, it was just so incredible because I could really kind of um, try and establish my vision and my voice as a director in a, in, in exactly the way that I wanted to without kind of any pressure of the industry or pressure of the, the sort of financial side of things or, um, and it was a very kind of pure creative energy that um, a group of, you know, group of people put into to, to making that, that first feature. So when going into limbo, I was kind of very well positioned because I'd already had the opportunity to kind of start establishing my voice and and and, and my vision um and then I just kind of went into you know and then it was just a lot of uh really hard painful work um and I spent a long time over writing the screenplay and I felt you know I just it was a, it was hugely challenging and and but I just kind of kept going and pushing through it and um, and then ended up with a script at the very end of it as I was sort of aged 10 years in, you know, in just a, a couple of years that, that, you know, and I had something that I was happy with. But you're better for it because of that uh, harrowing experience, right? That's what they say about the whole yeah. film experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, the first thing, one of the things I noticed really early on is this film is in a 4-3 aspect ratio and, and you know, was that always your vision of the film? I, I know that oftentimes that's used to kind of focus on the characters and kind of, you know, remove some of the excess noise in the film. But is that kind of always, you know, how you envisioned the film? Or is that just maybe the only thing you could get in an indie film was a 4-3 camera, so you just went with it, I don't know. 
Yeah, no, it was something that was kind of built into to the vision quite early on. I mean, it was and it was really for two two reasons, which is a lot of kind of the approach to the language of the film, um, which is really about on 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 one side, it's about Omar and about hit what he's feeling and what you know, and at times what the other characters are are going through. So having that um, academy aspect ratio was about kind of making them feeling feel trapped and claustrophobic um, on the island, on this kind of purgatorial island. Um, and then also kind of allowed us on the exteriors to frame um, in a certain way where we could then, we could sort of attack, uh, create more sky. Um, mm. So it would create the feeling of the, this sort of metaphor of this them being on this purgatorial island and create this feeling of them being sort of low down with this, this big sky above them. Um, and then it was, you know, and then the other side of that was that it's about kind of how we as the audience perceive um, the refugees and how kind of as, as Westerners we perceive refugees. So we deliberately uh, framed the, 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 the shots um, with the floor and the ceiling in and then putting it in the academy, it was actually creating a, a box um so it, and that's really about how kind of we as the, as as kind of the westerners were putting refugees in in a box in terms of our perception um in in terms of that kind of process of othering uh, so much thought into that into that aspect but i think it, it works perfectly it really kind of makes this film look very different and, and very unique so uh yeah, i think that was a great choice uh so this is your second film i imagine that there's probably a third on the horizon after maybe you have a nice rest when the film gets released uh but i guess you know what's uh what's next for you are you already working on other scripts other uh, other projects i am yeah i'm working away um i'm 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 working on a, on a on a couple of things um uh which i won't say too much about but but they're sort of it's still met very much with you know what i'm really interested in is kind of what's going on in the world right now and kind of looking at these kind of big global issues and trying to kind of approach those big topics um by distilling them down into the human context mm -hmm. and approaching them from an oblique angle with a sort of you know touch of humor and sort of offbeat um uh, style of, of of filmmaking I'm just going to throw it out there because this is a, a personal preference for me. I would love a Limbo 2 where we get to see what happens <laughs> when they get into society, right? <laughs> like, I think that would yeah. be a fascinating experience, too, to see the refugee experience trying to assimilate into a, a culture that has all these, you know, new yeah. sensations and prejudices and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the first pen. I'll take the first stab at writing. And I'll send you the script, and then you know we, we can collaborate. It'll be okay. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, for your time and for for joining me, and also for making this film. It's released April thirtieth, twenty twenty one. It's coming to theaters, so you can check it out then if you're comfortable, or if not, you can wait a little bit, wait in limbo until it comes to some other platform and see it. Then you really should. It's a it's a fantastic, stylish, and and very kind of human movie. So, well, thank you, awesome. thank you so much, David. Real Thank you. Take care. You. Cheers. Right. Thank Cheers. you. That was Ben Sherrock, the writer and director of Limbo, which is releasing April 30th, 2021. If you like this interview, please like and subscribe to this channel. It helps me out a lot to make sure all my new interviews go straight to you. And as always, please go to watcherpass.com for all your movie reviews, interviews, and recommendations. Thank you.